So making sure we're very, very clear. <laughs> Whenever we say the C word, we want to make sure that we are very, very clear that we're talking about reducing risk. Hit me, producer pots. Should we only be eating cooked veggies? Is there any truth yet to the idea that eating raw cruciferous veggies is bad for our thyroid health? So the quick answer is no both from a thyroid health perspective and cruciferous vegetables, as well as just from a general health perspective with a few caveats for certain health conditions where cooked vegetables can be better tolerated than raw. So let's tackle the uh, cruciferous vegetables for thyroid health myth first, and then we'll kind of like expand out a layer and kind of talk about cooked versus raw vegetables more generally. So. Uh, the Where that myth comes from is that the isothiocyanates in cruciferous vegetables, these are a product of, um, like, the, so the main class of phytonutrients in cruciferous vegetables are called glucosinolates. Glucosinolates live in a different cellular compartment from an enzyme called myrosinase. When we chew on the cruciferous vegetable or we chop it up, we break those cell uh, walls and then those two components meet. And the enzyme myrosinase basically breaks down the glucosinolates into a whole new class of phytonutrients called isothiocyanates. Uh, there's a few others, thiocyanates, indoles, but isothiocyanates have been shown in Petri dishes to be goitrogens, which means that they are a compound that interferes with thyroid hormone conversion from the uh, pro-thyroid, which is T4, to the active thyroid hormone, which is T3. So anything that interferes with thyroid hormone conversion from the, the pro-hormone to the active hormone, the pro-hormone is a little bit active. It's not exactly, it's not exactly an inactive form, which is why we call it a pro-hormone. But anything that interferes with that conversion is called a goitrogen. So isothiocyanates in uh, petri dishes have been shown to be goitrogenic. There were a couple of studies done like decades ago in like iodine deficient rabbits who were eating a ton of cabbage and they developed goiters, which is a enlargement of the thyroid gland uh, that is most more typically seen with iodine deficiency. Um, so there's this idea that in the context of iodine deficiency, maybe cruciferous vegetables can cause goiters and hypothyroidism. But there have been a collection of studies in humans eating uh, either cruciferous vegetables, things like broccoli sprouts or radish sprouts, or taking supplements uh, with these isolated compounds that have shown that when we were looking at the like the full class of compounds and how that's like actually interacts with our entire biology, that there is no change in T3, T4, TSH, uh, thyroid antibody numbers uh, for people with autoimmune uh, thyroid disease. So actually in humans, even in the context of iodine deficiency, and there's some mechanistic studies, some animal studies uh, in rats that have been done over the last five, six years that have been more thorough and more controlled than these original studies in rabbits that weren't actually designed to test this. It was just kind of like a, oh, whoops all of our rabbits have goiters, we think this might be it. So when they actually did experiments in rats where they actually made this group iodine deficiency and the iodine deficient and this group not, and then they gave this one a bunch of rutabaga sprouts and this group not, and then they had all the, right all of the different permutations of those conditions, they've been able to show uh, in both these mechanistic studies that are really geared at sort of understanding all the like underlying biochemistry of what's going on, as well as various human studies where they've looked at the viability of isothiocyanate as supplements. So for example, sulforaphane is a really famous member of this class of phytonutrients. And it's famous because it pretty dramatically reduces risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease, as well as neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's. So it's a really important health benefiting phytonutrient. So if we can, if we don't have to avoid it, we really shouldn't be, right? Like it's it's a very beneficial thing to have in our diets. So these more recent studies in humans and then the more recent, much better controlled animal studies have shown no change in thyroid function 
even in the context of iodine deficiency with very, very high intake of isothiocyanates from cruciferous vegetables. There was actually even one study in humans where they, it was not statistically significant, but it was a statistical trend. So whether or not that would hold up uh, in a larger study, we would have to do the larger study to know, but they actually showed a statistical trend towards the opposite, towards a reduced, um, like basically they're looking at the people who qualified as having autoimmune thyroid disease at the beginning of the study versus people who qualified at the end of the study. Some people got a control and some people got a high isothiocyanate supplement. I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, and so they looked at how many people qualified as having autoimmune thyroid disease because they had elevated thyroid antibodies uh, at the end of the study. And there was a statistical trend. Again, statistical trends always need to be <laughs> followed up by larger studies because we don't know if it's if it's real or if it or if it's not. Um, and they, but they showed a statistical trend towards a reduced uh, incidence of new autoimmune thyroid disease in the people who were getting the high isothi isothiocyanates from cruciferous vegetables. So if anything, cruciferous vegetables are doing the opposite and are reducing the likelihood of developing autoimmune thyroid disease compared to uh, the like normal risk of that in the general population. Wow. Again, more studies needed. But those studies, at the, at the very least, they show people with thyroid conditions or uh, with a family history of hyperthyroidism don't need to worry about cruciferous vegetables. And there's so many health benefits to cruciferous vegetables. So the reason why the myth is it's okay to have them cooked but not raw is because cooking deactivates the myrosinase enzyme. Uh, so that if you if you cook the Brussels sprout first and then chew it, it doesn't matter that you're making the glucosinolates and the myrosinase meat. Uh, the myrosinase is deactivated by the heat, so it can't make the isothiocyanates. But here's what's really important to know. Uh, we have a bunch of gut bacteria that make myrosinase, the enzyme that, that does the good stuff. Uh, so we still make isothiocyanates in our digestive tract. And the more you eat cruciferous vegetables, the more likely you are to have bacteria in your digestive tract that make myrosinase. Uh, so we don't have to only eat vegetables raw to benefit from isothiocyanates. Um, we don't need to worry, we're still, we don't need to worry about only cooking them if we have autoimmune thyroid disease or any other type of thyroid disease. Um, again, your, your doctor does trump me. So if your doctor has another reason for only wanting you to eat cooked cruciferous vegetables, um, they, they, they still know your health history better than I do. Um, but I would maybe encourage um, you to bring some of these papers to them so they can see that maybe the science has changed since these rabbit studies from decades ago. Um, and, um, and but again, your doctor knows you better. <laughs> um, right. But yeah, so like we don't need to only eat cruciferous vegetables raw to benefit from these compounds. And we don't need to only eat them cooked if we have hyperthyroidism. So taking that, that step, one level out, which is just talk about the benefits of this class, like not just sulforaphane, but basically glucosinolates and their metabolites from when they meet myrosinase, so isothiocyanates, thiocyanates, and indoles. As a class of phytonutrients, their biggest protection for us is reducing risk of cancer. They're some of the most cancer protective phytonutrients that we can get. Kind of a uh, they're, they're like competitor for anti-cancer benefits are the um, thiosulfonates in uh, alliums, so the onion family. So they kind of work through similar mechanisms, but not identical. So it's best if we eat both cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, kale, cabbage, rutabaga, uh, as well as onions, garlic, chives. Like ideally we'd get both. Um, so those, that class of phytonutrients very, very powerfully reduces risk of cancer. That doesn't mean they prevent cancer for completely, right? They just turn down our risk. Uh, and it doesn't mean that they will cure cancer. This is about developing it. There is no diet that will cure cancer. So making sure we're very, very clear. <laughs> Whenever we say the C word, we want to make sure that we are very, very clear that we're talking about reducing risk and not promising uh, to eliminate risk or any kind of any kind of curative properties 
Right. Um, but cruciferous vegetables are one of the most important vegetables to eat on a regular basis for reducing risk of cancer. And many, many different types of cancer are reduced um, by eating cruciferous vegetables regularly. They also reduce risk of cardiovascular disease. And as I mentioned, some of them like sulforaphane also reduce risk of neurodegenerative disease. Some of them are also really good for metabolic health. So it can also reduce risk of type two diabetes. So a very, very important class of phytonutrients. So taking that out yet another layer in our, in our onion of raw versus <laughs> cooked. Um, however you like vegetables, that's the way to eat them, right? It's much more important that you eat enough vegetables than whether or not they're raw or cooked. Oh, if that's good like to know. Okay. Both. If you like both, the changes in the fiber structure from cooking, when you take a raw vegetable and you cook it, however you cook it, heat is what causes the, the changes. So it doesn't matter if you steam it or boil it or roast it or saute it or stir fry it or <laughs> grill it, right? However you cook it, the, the changes that that heat causes in the fiber structure change what species of bacteria will eat that fiber. It basically changes the, the food so that it will support different species of bacteria. Still good species. So we've got great, good, desirable gut bacteria that like to eat uh, the fiber from raw vegetables. And we've got other good, desirable gut bacteria that like to eat the fiber from cooked vegetables. So in an ideal world, because dietary diversity helps to support gut microbiome diversity, this also refers to diversity in preparation methods for at least fruits and vegetables. So ideally we would mix it up and sometimes eat our vegetables cooked and sometimes eat our vegetables raw. So ideally we would be consuming both. Studies that have looked at how raw versus cooked vegetables impact all cause mortality, which is a general indicator of health and longevity, show that they're independently beneficial. Again, meaning we are healthiest when we consume both, when we incorporate both raw and cooked vegetables into our overall diets. And they both reduce risk of all cause mortality by about 10% per 100 grams we consume per day. So kind of similar magnitude of benefit. So ideally we would have raw and cooked vegetables every day, or at least most days mixing it up. But again, that is like secondary to getting enough vegetables. So if you only like your vegetables roasted, that's the only way you're gonna eat vegetables. It's much better to eat those roasted vegetables than to try to like choke back the carrot sticks that you hate, right? Uh, if you only like salad and you don't like roasted vegetables, it's much better to eat that salad rather than to like gag on the roasted vegetables, right? So it's it's much right. better to eat enough vegetables, but like the next the next level of iterating on if we'll, we'll call it an optimal human diet, although I'm not sure such a thing truly exists. But the next level of iteration would be to mix up raw versus cooked, in addition to mixing up. You know, the whole eat the rainbow and the different fruit and vegetable families and you know also hitting dietary diversity and your 30 plant foods a week like among all of that like next level stuff would be mixing up raw versus cooked because they're independently beneficial this is so incredibly helpful thank you for busting that myth and then also just making us realize we don't have to fuss as much as we think we do <laughs> like it's just about enjoying them how we like them and if that's a mix that's great and if not no big deal so where can we learn more like myth busting like this this was fascinating so we are adding a lot more myth busting articles to nutrivore.com and there is an entire chapter busting myths like this including talking about uh isothiocyanates as goitrogens in my book, Nutribor. So chapter 10 is entirely dedicated to busting myths that make you afraid of food. So I would like to alleviate your fear of especially uh, health promoting foods that are easy to prepare, accessible, found in most grocery stores and budget friendly. I want to make sure that I am giving you the good information about those foods to uh, counteract all of the fear mongering misinformation that's online about those foods. So that's why there's an entire chapter in my book dedicated to myth busting. So I would say, come check out the website, nutrivore.com or pick up a copy of my book. Also, uh, you can request a copy at your, your local library if your library doesn't have a copy already. Uh, and also like stick around because uh, we like to bust myths on social media. So um, probably if there's a myth you've heard, um, it's probably on my video to-do list too. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. Thank you. <laughs>